Wow. I think most of you in this room know me in some capacity. And um, you know that Lincoln has uh, been a large part of my life. My wife has reminded me that our first date uh, was to this banquet. Um, <laughs> she, she didn't know what to make of this nerdy historian saying, so, have you ever been to a Lincoln banquet before? <laughs> um, but the line worked. Smooth. Yeah. Um, it was 30 years ago to this day that I gave my first paper at the Abraham Lincoln Symposium, thanks to Roger, uh, and that I attended my first banquet. The banquet speaker that evening was Mario Cuomo, who was going to be introduced by then Governor James Thompson. Both were being talked about as being presidential contenders. Uh, I got to meet Governor Cuomo, and he had his younger son with him, Andrew, who is now governor. Uh, and it was, uh, we had to find the largest venue in Springfield to accommodate the interest, uh, which at that time was the Holiday Inn East. Uh, some of you may remember the building. Uh, we sold out, and plans were made, and then they discovered that Easter came early, and that Lincoln's birthday, which fell on Wednesday, was Ash Wednesday, and that the observant Catholics would not be able to eat the selection of either chicken or beef. So Georgia Northrup, who to me was the heart and soul of, of this organization for so many years, went to see the bishop. To, to ask for dispensation. And those of you who knew Georgia knew that she was the quintessential mother. You, you just couldn't refuse her. Uh, she, she was very polite but had that steely determination. Well, you know, the bishop, he just, he wilted. But he said, Mrs. Northrup, you know, I would give you that dispensation for any other day, but I can't do it for Ash Wednesday. So she went and added fish to the menu. So we had over 600 people at this venue. The servers come out and they start asking people, beef, chicken, fish. And for some reason, people must have thought the fish was especially appealing that night. <laughs> By the time they got to the back of the room, all of the fish was gone. All of the observant Catholics were, were waiting for a miracle to happen of more loaves of fishes. <laughs> Alas, it didn't happen. The other thing I learned at that banquet, and I thank Roger for this, um, a very popular author of astrological books came all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada to be in attendance. And thankfully, Roger decided he would deal with her and, and let me enjoy the evening. She ended up spending till one o'clock in the morning chain smoking and telling Roger the story of how she was descended from twin sisters who were the result of a liaison between Abraham Lincoln and an Australian or an Austrian princess. <laughs> he he had he had uh, produced two love children, twin daughters, and that she was in the lineage from the one, and Howard Hughes <laughs> was lineage in the other. Now, the one thing that actually made sense in that is that they both were eccentrics, right? 
they both lived uh, in a hotel room in Las Vegas. And in fact, this person died in a hotel room in Las Vegas. But as evidence of, of, of the story, she had a print that she claims Abraham Lincoln gave to this, this uh, royal princess and that he had signed it. Well, it indeed was a print. It had Lincoln's signature on it, but as was common in that day, they engraved his signature on the steel plate. And so Roger tried to explain that to her. And she said, oh, no, no, no. I know it's ink, real, a real signature, because I used ink eradicator, and the ink came off. <laughs> well, you know, these things are made with a steel engraving and ink. <laughs> ink will come off. So anyway, she, uh, she left the information, and Roger said that he would deliver it to the new Lincoln curator and have him respond. Uh, all of this was a way of teaching me that February 12th, um, actually, that was not unusual for most of the February 12ths I presided at. So uh, it, it, it was very good training. Um, thank you all. And again, I want to voice my <coughs> deep appreciation to Bob Lenz and his leadership. It, it's really been outstanding. John G. Nicolay, Abraham Lincoln's tall, lanky personal secretary, who possessed sharp angular features that intimidated many unsuspecting visitors, and whose Germanic accent belied his true country of birth, composed a brief letter on August 24, 1864, to his friend and fellow secretary, John Hay, who was in Illinois on business. Tired and writing without fear of public disclosure, Nicolay declared, hell is to pay. The New York politicians have got a stampede on that is about to swamp everything. Raymond and the National Committee are here today. Raymond thinks a commission to Richmond is about the only sale to save us. While the tycoon, his reference to Lincoln, sees and says it would be utter ruination. The matter is now undergoing consultation. Weak-kneed damn fools like Charles Sumner are in the movement for a new candidate to supplant the tycoon. Everything is darkness and doubt and discouragement. Our men see giants in the airy and unsubstantial shadows of the opposition and are about to surrender without a fight. I think that today here is the turning point in our crisis. If the president can infect Raymond and his committee with some of his own patience and pluck, we are saved. If our friends will only rub their eyes and shake themselves, and become convinced that they themselves are not dead, we shall win the fight overwhelmingly. Politics and the fate of their boss, Abraham Lincoln, seemed to occupy the thoughts of both secretaries. Writing to Nicolay on the same evening of August 24th, Hay began his letter with a joking reference to the Democratic National Convention that would take place in Chicago. We are waiting with the greatest interest for the hatching of the big peace snakes in Chicago. And that's a reference to both the compromise peace platform that the Democrats uh, were proposing and that Democrats were also like poisonous copperhead snakes who struck without warning. Uh, Hay goes on. Uh, there is, throughout the country, I mean the rural districts, a good healthy union feeling and an intention to succeed in the military and political contests. But everywhere in the towns, the copperheads are exultant, and our own people either growling and despondent or sneakingly apologetic. I found among my letters here, you, sent by you, one from Joe Medill, the editor of the Chicago Tribune, inconceivably impotent, and he informs me that on the 4th of next March, thanks to Mr. Lincoln's blunders and follies, we'll be kicked out of the White House. The damn scoundrel needs a day's hanging. I won't answer his letter till I return and let you see it. Old Uncle Jesse K. Du Bois, a Springfield politician, is talking like an ass. Says if the Chicago nomination nominee is a good man, he don't know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He blackguards you and me. Says we're too big for our britches. A fault of which it seems to me either nature or our tailors are to blame. <laughs> After all your kindness to the old whelp and his cub of a son, he hates you because you've not done and more. 
I believe he thinks the executive mansion is somehow to blame because Bill, his, Du Bois' son, married a harlot and Dick Oglesby is popular. Hay ends the letter with an angry resignation. I lose my temper sometimes talking with growling Republicans. There is a diseased restlessness about men in these times that unfits them for the steady support of an administration. It seems as if they were appearing, there were appearing in the Republican Party the elements of disorganization that destroyed the Whigs. If the dumb cattle are not worthy of another term of Lincoln, then let the will of God be done and the murn of McClellan fall on them. The musings of Nicolay and Hay reflected the anxiety of political insiders about Dim's, uh, Lincoln's dim re-election chances. And even Lincoln's closest political associates seemed to be backing away from him. Orville Hickman Browning, uh, a longtime friend and political associate of Lincoln, voiced serious reservations about the president in a letter to fellow Re Republican Senator Edgar Cowan. Writing on September 6, 1864, Browning gently inquired how Lincoln's re-election prospects were in Pennsylvania. He then went on to offer this assessment. I'm in a situation to act with entire independence. I am neither an office holder or an office seeker, but I'm prepared to sacrifice all personal prejudices, predilections and affections, and all personal political ties and obligations to what I may conscientiously believe to be the best interests of our unhappy country. You know, strange as it may seem to you, I am personally attached to the president and have faithfully tried to uphold him and make him respectable, though I've never been able to persuade myself that he was big enough for his position. Still, I thought he might get through college without disgrace and without knowledge, but I fear he is a failure. To add insult to injury, Browning ended with the following quip. I think McClellan's a good man, a true patriot, and the ablest general we've had. But I don't know what sort of president he would make. The dissatisfaction expressed in these letters reflects, ironically, Lincoln's argument for opposing secession and waging war to end it. In his first inaugural address, Lincoln declared, plainly, the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments is the only true sovereign of a free people. Whoever rejects it does of necessity fly to anarchy or to des despotism. Unanimity is impossible and the rule of a minority as permanent arrangement is wholly inadmissible. So that rejecting the majority principle, anarchy or despotism in some form is all that's left. Protecting self-governance, free and fair elections comporting to constitutional guidelines within the framework of national union was the off-stated goal of the war. Lincoln argued, our popular government has often been called an experiment. Two points in it, our people have already settled the successful establishing and successful administering of it. One still remains, its successful maintenance against a formidable internal attempt to overthrow it. It is now for them to demonstrate to the world and for those who can fairly carry an election can also suppress a rebellion. That ballots are the rightful and peaceful successors of bullets and that when ballots have been fairly and constitutionally decided, there can be no successful appeal back to bullets. That there can be no successful appeal except to ballots themselves at succeeding elections. Such will be a great lesson of peace, teaching men that what they cannot take by an election, neither can they take it by a war, teaching all the folly of being the beginners of a war. Observing free elections during peacetime could be fraught with difficulty. The same elections during a bloody civil war entered unknown territory. Moreover, the American electorate rarely rewarded sitting presidents with two terms. One had to go back to 1832 to find an example when the American public elected a sitting president to a second term in office. 
Andrew Jackson's bold, often brash actions against South Carolina's nullification doctrine, and Nicholas Biddle's monster bank were rewarded at the ballot box. Would the American public reward Abraham Lincoln for his wartime leadership and emancipation policies? Unlike his predecessor, James Buchanan, who was all too eager to escape the presidency after one term, Lincoln signaled his interest to his friend and fellow Illinois Republican, Elihu Washburn, late in 1863, claiming, a second term would be a great honor and a great labor, which together perhaps I would not decline if tendered. Lincoln was well aware that many considerations would influence both his receiving the nomination and winning the election. To win the nomination, Lincoln needed to maintain control of the fractious personalities and coalitions that comprised the Republican Party. Americans needed to be reassured that military efforts costing so much blood and treasure were leading to a successful culmination in a Union victory. If the war had no end in sight, Lincoln's chances at re-election were nil. Lincoln understood the power of pub public opinion in his 1858 debates with Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln proclaimed, in this age and in this country, public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. Whoever molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. An example of Lincoln's molding public sentiment can be seen early in January 1864 when he took time from other pressing matters to write to an elderly Pittsburgh woman, Esther Stockton. The widow of the Reverend Joseph Stockton, Esther did her part to advance the cause of union through her knitting skills. Lincoln offered his warm compliments to Stockton, learning that you who have passed the 84th year of life have given to the soldiers some 300 pairs of stockings knitted by yourself I wish to offer you my thanks. Will you also convey my thanks to those young ladies who have done so much in feeding our soldiers while passing through your city? The letter appeared in leading Republican newspapers throughout the country, clearly intended to show the sacrifices on the home front of old and young to aid in the war effort. Its purpose was to boost public morale by offering a memorable story of selfless efforts. A more difficult task was dealing with the internal discord within the Republican ranks. The enormous popularity and influence on current policymakers of Doris Kearns Goodwin's team of rivals has emphasized the ongoing battles of personalities within Lincoln's cabinet. The obvious dramatic elements of the rivalries and enormous egos of many of the individuals were vividly brought to life by the storyteller Goodwin. But while Goodwin focused on a handful of cabinet officials, often lost were the equally significant battles being waged in the Republican Congress and at the state and local levels. It's important to note that Lincoln, having spent most of his political life as an Illinois Whig, always in the minority, now was in a position as the head of the Republican Party to achieve something that had always eluded him, creating a majority party capable of winning elections and governing the nation. The dramatic nature and stakes of the war often obscure many of the mundane tasks that occupied much of Lincoln's time. Building a strong Republican Party meant rewarding deserving party faithful with government patronage jobs. Of the 1,520 presidential positions he controlled in 1861, Lincoln replaced 1,195 with loyal Republicans a larger turnover than any previous president. Well over 40,000 other civilian jobs <laughs> comprised the manpower of the federal government in 1861. The necessities of war and large government services to nearly 195,000 civilian workers by 1865. Working with Republican governors and members of Congress, Lincoln built the party through patronage appointments. Undoubtedly, the rapid growth of the government workforce would have surprised even Lincoln. Had he been asked how many people worked at any given time in the federal government during his presidency, he likely would have responded, well, I guess about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Lincoln, however, was not the only Republican leader filling burgeoning government jobs with loyal followers. Edward Bates, Lincoln's Attorney General, confided in his diary on October 17, 1863, Chase's head is turned by his eagerness in pursuit of the presidency. For a long time, he's been filling all the offices in his own vast patronage with extreme partisans and contrives to fill many vacancies properly belonging to other departments. In fact, Sam and P. Chase, Lincoln's temperamental secretary of the Treasury, controlled roughly 15,000 jobs. Lincoln was well aware of Chase's actions and often had to intervene when his Treasury secretary refused to defer to other Republican leaders concerning plum positions in their states. Despite Chase being a high maintenance cabinet official, for example, Republican Senator Benjamin Wade snarled that Chase thinks there's a fourth person in the Trinity, Lincoln admired his Treasury Secretary's creative skills at financing the war. Well aware of Chase's political ambitions, Congressman John B. Alley from Massachusetts recalls Lincoln musing, as to his talk about me, I do not mind that. Chase is on the whole a pretty good fellow and a very able man. His only trouble is that he has the White House fever a little too bad. A full outbreak of Chase's White House fever appeared in February 1864. As Lincoln loyalists began gearing up for his renomination, it became clear that equally vigorous organizing efforts were being made to advance the presidential nomination of Chase. Suddenly, roughly 100 Republican leaders received a handbill that was named the Pomeroy Circular after the Republican senator from Kansas, S.C. Pomeroy. While Pomeroy was uh, probably not the author of the circular, he allowed a signature to be placed on it, and it was sent to potential supporters of Sam and Pete Chase. The circular extolled the virtues and talents of Chase while arguing that Lincoln's poor performance made him unelectable. Even if Lincoln were to win re-election, there was no indication that victory on the battlefield would be forthcoming. To top it off, the circular criticized the growth of government patronage that made it imperative to hold Lincoln to one term to prevent executive despotism. With all of these dangers looming with Lincoln's reelection, Chase supporters had to quickly organize to save the country from the continuation of the disastrous Lincoln administration. In part, the Pomeroy Circular grew out of the contentious feud between the two Republican Kansas senators, Pomeroy and James H. Lane. Lane, a strong supporter of Lincoln, prompted Pomeroy to support Chase, Lincoln's rival. The constant bickering of the Kansans prompted Lincoln to write to Pomeroy, I wish you and Lane would make a sincere effort to get out of the mood you're in. It does neither of you any good, and it gives you the means of tormenting my life out of me and nothing else. In spite of numerous attempts by loyal supporters to make Lincoln aware of the movement against his reelection, he refused to read the Pomeroy Circular or take steps to remove Chase from his cabinet. Like Lincoln, Chase claimed publicly to have no knowledge of the circular or being in any way involved with its creation or distribution. On February 22nd, newspapers across the country began printing the text of the Pomeroy Circular. Rather than undermining the public's confidence in the Lincoln administration, disclosure of the circular had an immediate and opposite effect. Resolutions in support of Lincoln's renomination proliferated at local and state levels. Even the General Assembly of Ohio, Chase's home state, overwhelmingly endorsed Lincoln's nomination for a second term on February 25, 1864. Knowing that attempts to take the nomination away from Lincoln at the regular convention were futile, Chase asked his supporters on March 5th that no further consideration be given to my name. Reaction to Sam and Pete Chase's removing his name from consideration was met with skepticism in many quarters. The New York Herald reminded their readers that the salmon is a queer fish, very shy and very wary. Often it appears to avoid the bait just before gulping it down. And even after it's hooked, it has to be allowed plenty of line and must be played carefully before it can be safely landed. 
Even with Chase temporarily out of the way, Lincoln still faced opposition within the Republican ranks. Many of Chase's supporters began talking of an alternative convention and candidate, settling on John C. Fremont, the Republican presidential nominee in 1856, and a controversial political general. On May 31st, a convention of 400 disgruntled operatives met in Cleveland, Ohio, and named Fremont as their candidate. Fremont attacked Lincoln, claiming, Today we have in this country the abuse of military dictation without its unity of action and vigor of execution. Lincoln told his boss that Fremont would be dangerous if he had more ability and energy. Not to be outdone, Lincoln responded, yes, he's like Jim Jett's brother. Jim used to say that his brother was the damnedest scoundrel that ever lived, but in the infinite mercy of providence, he was also the damnedest fool. <laughs> Lincoln had tangled with Fremont early in the war during his contentious service as commander of the Department of the West. Fremont bickered with Francis P. P. Blair Jr., brother of Lincoln's postmaster, General Montgomery Blair, over the control of Missouri policy. Taking the extreme step of arresting Blair and threatening him with court-martial, Fremont fomented the enduring animosity of the Blair family. They responded in kind, accusing Fremont of military incompetence and financial corruption, prompting a federal investigation. Fremont also overstepped his authority late in 1861, declaring martial law in Missouri, as well as ordering the confiscation of property of disloyal citizens, thereby freeing their slaves. Lincoln immediately instructed Fremont to amend his directive reserving only to the president the authority to rule on any individual sentence to be executed and requiring the confiscation of property to be in accord with earlier congressional action, essentially rescinding an emancipation of slaves. Given Fremont's penchant for precipitous action, Lincoln did not believe that the Pathfinder could win the 1864 election. It was possible, however, that Fremont could siphon out enough Republican votes to throw the election to the Democrats. By contrast, the regular Republican convention met in Baltimore on June 7th and 8th. Much of the platform mirrored early Republican goals, continued military efforts until the South surrendered, a transcontinental railroad linking the nation, increased immigration, economy and efficiency in government, and opposing attempts from any European powers uh, working to establish monarchical governments in the Western Hemisphere. At Lincoln's direction to party chairman Edwin D. Morgan, days before the convention, a plank was added urging the adoption of the 13th Amendment, which would abolish slavery. In part, this action was an attempt to woo some of Fremont's radical supporters back to the traditional Republican fold. It was also entirely consistent with Lincoln's own efforts to resolve the issue through constitutional measures, believing that military actions and presidential proclamations were only interim solutions. Lincoln had always portrayed his actions in prosecuting the war as placing the interests of union above those of party. Hence, the convention chose to assume a new identity as the National Union Party, although in reality, it remained Lincoln's Republican Party. A number of Union Democrats were rumored to replace Hannibal Hamlin as Lincoln's vice president. John Nicolay, representing Lincoln's interests at the convention, knew that Lincoln conveyed to him no preference for a running mate, willing to leave the decision in the hands of the convention. The selection of Andrew Johnson, a Democrat, but ardent Unionist and military governor in the divided state of Tennessee, clearly reflected Lincoln's desire to maintain a un united front in pursuing the war. Had Lincoln and the convention looked more deeply into Johnson's political views, other than his loyalty to the Union, they undoubtedly would have had second thoughts about his candidacy. Much of Lincoln's reelection would turn on military success on the battlefield. On March 9, 1864, in a White House ceremony, Lincoln formally promoted Ulysses S. Grant to the rank of Lieutenant General. Initially wary of Grant's political ambitions, Lincoln was satisfied that the general's interests lie 
in defeating the rebel army and not seeking the presidency. Three days after his promotion, Grant assumed command of all the Union armies. With Lincoln's input and blessing, Grant devised a spring offensive that would attack all fronts simultaneously. This tactic led Lincoln to quip, those not skinning can hold a leg. The results were less than impressive. While Grant assured Lincoln that I intend to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer, it was clear that the rebel army would remain a continued threat well after the election. Enormous losses from the Wilderness Campaign and other setbacks at Spotsylvania, Hanover Junction, Cold Harbor, and Petersburg pointed to a stalled offensive and a bloody road without a clear end. Lincoln was forced to call for 500,000 more men at a time when war weariness was at its peak. Republican governors warned the president that a draft call would spell doom for, the Republican, for Republican victories in the fall elections. To add insult to injury, Jubal Early managed to drive through the Shenandoah Valley with his army of 15,000 seasoned Confederate troops, with Washington, D.C. as the objective. Grant set Horatio Wright's Sixth Corps to protect Washington. Lincoln decided to witness the military action firsthand from the parapet of Fort Stevens. Legend has it that Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., not knowing it was Lincoln, standing in full view of Confederate sharpshooters yelled, get down you damn fool. <laughs> More likely, it was another soldier admonishing the president to take cover. But the danger was there, as the next day, when Lincoln again visited the parapet, an army surgeon standing nearby was shot in the thigh. This encounter provides Lincoln with the unique distinction of being the only sitting president to come under enemy fire. Early's invasion of the Capitol was repulsed, but he allegedly boasted, we haven't taken Washington, but we scared Abe Lincoln like hell. July also witnessed another heated argument between congressional radicals and Lincoln over Reconstruction. The bill of Ohio Senator Benjamin F. Wade and Maryland Senator Henry Winter Davis was uh, in ways at odds with Lincoln's views on Reconstruction. While the Wade-Davis bill passed both chambers of Congress, Lincoln's refusal to sign it effectively killed it with a pocket veto. Lincoln explained his objections in a veto message on July 8th, which only inflamed the authors of the bill to issue their own rejoinder on August 5th. The schism within the Republican Party reached its height in August, leading many to wonder it was too late to find another candidate who had a chance of winning. Even Lincoln doubted his chances of reelection. On August 23rd, he drafted a memorandum that stated, this morning, as for to some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to so cooperate with the president-elect as to save the union between the election and the inauguration as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. Folding the paper to prevent his cabinet from reading the text, Lincoln had each member sign the blind memorandum, pledging them to support a new administration. Although the Democrats would not hold their convention until August 29th, Lincoln was assuming that the delegates must nominate a peace Democrat on a war platform or a war Democrat on a peace platform. The gathering of Democrats to the Windy City began with a sense of giddy optimism. A platform was crafted that reflected the interest of peace Democrats who made it clear that the war was a failure. It offered an ambiguous statement about reunion claiming, efforts be made for the cessation of hostilities with a view of an ultimate convention of the states or other peaceable means to that end at the earliest practicable moment, peace may be restored on the basis of the Federal Union of the States. But how is that to be achieved without military means? The convention nominated George B. McClellan as their candidate. Little Mac was popular with the Army of the Potomac and indicated before the convention that he believed the war could end only with a military solution. Now he was faced with either rejecting the party's platform that he was to represent or subject 
his own personal views to be secondary to those of the party. In accepting the nomination a week later, McClellan repudiated the peace platform and argued that the only way to preserve the Union was to crush the rebel army. Now, it appeared that the Republicans were not the only party with internal fissures undermining the possibility of electoral success. Feuding Democrats gave many Republicans renewed hope in Lincoln's chances. John Nicolay, writing to his fiance, Therena Bates, on September 11th, reflects the restored party optimism. While the week just passed had brought us to no event or startling nature of great magnitude, there have been some lesser ones that are gratifying and which assist materially in improving the general feeling of the country and especially the political situation. First, Sherman's victory at Atlanta, according to the details received, proves in every way as effective and as important as it was expected from the first and incomplete report. Second, McClellan, having written and published his letter of acceptance and having attempted in it to ignore and dodge the question presented by the platform, whether he was for war or peace, finds the difference of opinion on this point in his party irreconcilable and has developed a, a row in the happy Democratic family, which promises to be serious. Two influential New York papers have already repudiated him. Go at husband, go at bear. And that's a reference to joke Lincoln liked to talk, uh, tell about a wife whose husband was attacked by a bear and the wife cheers, go at husband, go at bear, not caring who wins. <laughs> Nicolay goes on. Third, the publication of Grant's letter in which he gives an encouraging view of the military situation and tells the country the true road to peace is through hard fighting till the rebellion is put down. Fourth, the Vermont election, which shows from 3,000 to 5,000 gain on her former Republican majority. Fifth, the acceptance of the money men of the new $30 million loan recently offered by Fessenden, the Secretary of Treasury, about three times the amount having been bid for. Altogether, the results of the week are most cheering and inspiring. The political situation has not been as hopeful for six months past as it is just now. There's a perfect revolution in feeling. Three weeks ago, our friends everywhere were despondent, almost to the point of giving up the contest in despair. Now, they're hopeful, jubilant, hard at work, and confident of success. Indeed, the momentum of events seemed decidedly in Lincoln's favor. Through a complicated series of events, Lincoln dismissed Montgomery Blair, the Bete Noir, of Fremont, Chase, and other radicals. With Blair's departure from the cabinet, Fremont was willing to withdraw from the presidential contest, leaving radical Republicans without an alternative to Lincoln. Salmon P. Chase campaigned for Lincoln, believing that the president would likely appoint him to fill the opening on the Supreme Court should the ailing Chief Justice Roger Taney die. On October 12, 1864, Chase got his wish. Tawney's death was met without much sympathy in Republican circles. George Templeton Strong, a New York lawyer, upon hearing of Tawney's passing deadpanned, better late than never. <laughs> For Chase, it meant opportunity, and Lincoln knew that, the, that black freedom would be safe under a Supreme Court led by his former Treasury Secretary. Ultimately, elections are determined by voters. Just as Republicans accuse Democrats of nationalizing slavery with the Dred Scott decision, um, Democrats accuse the Lincoln administration of conspiring to destroy all civil liberties. Pointing to the suppression of the writ of habeas corpus, the injustice of the confiscation acts, the creation of West Virginia from the existing Commonwealth of Virginia, and the detention and arbitrary arrest of anti-administration voices, Democrats hoped to paint Lincoln as a dictator. Numerous pamphlets were distributed to make their case, such as Thomas Jefferson Miles, the conspiracy of leading men of the Republican Party to destroy the American Union, proved by their words and acts, antecedent and subsequent to the rebellion. More pernicious was the appearance of miscegenation, the theory of the blending of the races applied to the American white man and Negro. 
This pamphlet was circulated among leading abolitionists in an attempt to secure their support for the theory of miscegenation. The word was first coined in the pamphlet, combining the Latin miscera to mix with genus or race. Democratic bosses felt that if prominent Republicans and abolitionists supported the theory of blending the races to achieve racial harmony, the endorsement could be used to incite the racial fears of working men, especially Irish immigrants, who feared that their displacement by newly freed slaves. No prominent Republicans embraced the theory, although a few leading abolitionists um, gave their support. Democratic leaders and campaign tracks used the theory of miscegenation to fuel public fears about race relations and the wisdom of emancipation. Playing the race card was not new in American politics, for the Republican Party had always been disparagingly referred to as black Republicans or woolly-headed Republicans by their Democratic foes. The election of 1864, however, witnessed a new low in race baiting. The sum of Democratic attacks against Lincoln are best summarized in the Lincoln Catechism, wherein the eccentricities and beauties of despotism are fully set forth. Like most campaign satires, this Democratic pamphlet invokes the standard fears of miscegenation, worthless paper currency, government corruption, and the loss of civil liberties should Lincoln be reelected. The depravities of the Lincoln administration were set to a parody of the Lord's Prayer. Father Abraham, who art in Washington of glorious memory since, the date of thy proclamation to free Negroes, thy kingdom come and overthrow the republic, Thy will be done, and the laws perish. Give us this day our daily supply of greenback. Forgive us our plunders, but destroy the copperheads. Lead us into fat pastures, but deliver us from the eye of detectives. And make us the equal of the Negro, for such shall be our kingdom and the glory of thy administration. Clearly, the Democrats' appeal to voters was to their fears, rather than the better angels of their nature. Republicans also took the low road, referring to Democrats as copperheads, inferring that they were disloyal, and working to undermine the war effort with a compromise peace. The party apparatus reached out to patronage appointees to demand financial contributions to Lincoln and Johnson clubs. Buoyed by Sherman's capture of Atlanta, Georgia, David Farragut's naval success at Mobile Bay, and Philip Sheridan's destruction of Jubal Early's army and preventing the Shenandoah Valley, Valley from resupplying Lee's army with food stuffs, Lincoln looked to capitalize on the soldiers' vote. While many states allowed soldiers to vote in the field, Indiana did not. It was one of three key states, along with Pennsylvania and Ohio, that held state elections in October. Lincoln implored Sherman to furlough as many Indiana troops as possible to go home to vote in the state elections, a request that Sherman uh, was too savvy to refuse. As a result, all three states resulted in Republican victories, in large part carried by the soldier vote. When the national election took place on November 8th, Lincoln carried nearly every loyal state. Obtaining nearly 500,000 more votes than McClellan, Lincoln led the electoral votes 212 to McClellan's 21. Of the states that went for the Democrat, only New Jersey, Delaware, and Kentucky favored McClellan. Eight out of every 10 soldiers' vote went for Lincoln, helping provide the margin of victory for the Republicans. John Hay recorded election night in Washington was rainy, and he and Lincoln sat in the War Department waiting for, uh, for returns over the telegraph when Thomas Eckhart, one of the telegraph operators, came in, shaking the rain from his cloak, his pants covered in mud. Explaining that he had slipped crossing the street and fell in the mud, Lincoln was reminded of a story. For such an awkward fellow, Lincoln began, I'm pretty sure-footed. It used to take a pretty dexterous man to throw me. I remember the evening of the day in 1858 that decided the contest for the Senate between Mr. Douglas and myself. It was something like this, dark, rainy, and gloomy. I'd been reading the returns and had ascertained that we had lost the legislature and started to go home. 
The path had been worn hogback and was slippery. My foot, foot slipped out from under me, knocking the other one out of the way. But I recovered myself and lit square, and I said to myself, it's a slip, not a fall. Mindful of how hopeless Republican prospects seemed only months earlier, Lincoln and his party recovered their balance to win the election. If the outcome of the election surprised Lincoln with a second term, he was not surprised by the more significant fact that a national election could take place during a time of great strife. Speaking to the gathering days after the election, Lincoln mused, we cannot have free government without elections. And if the rebellion could force us to forgo or postpone a national election, it might fairly claim to have already conquered and ruined us. But the election, along with its incidental and undesirable strife, has done good too. It has demonstrated that a people's government can sustain a national election in the midst of a great civil war. Until now, it has not been known to the world that this was a possibility. It shows how sound and how strong we still are. The soundness and strength with Lincoln referenced reflected his faith in the resilience of the Republican small r form of government. When Lincoln addressed the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield on January 28, 1838, he referenced he, or he referred to the veterans who fought in the American Revolution as living history. These individuals were able to impart not only the scenes of the revolution, but the passions that drove their involvement. The founding generation, as Lincoln stated, were the pillars of the Temple of Liberty, and now they have crumbled away, and the temple must fall unless we, their descendants, supply their places with other pillars hewn from the solid quarry of sober reason. How it must have given Lincoln immense satisfaction to learn that John Phillips of rural Sturbridge, Massachusetts, a Democrat of the Jeffersonian School, Phillips had voted in every presidential election beginning with George Washington. At age 105, Phillips rode two miles to town to vote accompanied by his 79-year-old son. Lacking a secret ballot in Massachusetts, Philip announced to the clerk of the election that he was casting his vote for Abraham Lincoln. While Phillips cannot be claimed to be representative of how others from the revolutionary era would have voted in 1864, it was some, a symbolic endorsement of everything that Lincoln claimed he was trying to preserve. The aspirations of the Declaration seeking to realize more fully the equality of men, maintaining the Union, and making certain that self-government is not a mere abstraction. With the first two goals still in doubt, Lincoln showed the world through the election of 1864 that self-governance was alive and well in spite of the Civil War. Thank you.